Okay, welcome. We, and we have some momentum from yesterday. So here was uh, the output on the wall there from KI Storm about um, Monday AM in particular. Many of you were in that session, and I think we can feed off of it. Um, and so I'll let you just browse that over and encourage you to pick up the and open from KI Storm the, uh, the sheet online doc. And because uh, uh, I know uh, she's eager, uh, you know, Elizabeth, can I ask you to be a scribe? Yeah, I'll scribe. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. And then uh, maybe one other if uh, going. I can do it, Neil. Once. Just for Yeah. Okay, Team Vandy. Team Vanderbilt. Yeah. Go ahead, gang. Okay, right on. Um, so, um, the, uh, I, it, early yesterday in the AM, when I was on computer audio, I was sort of garbled in my first attempt. So, uh, I would encourage you to look up the phone number and I'll put it into chat, uh, cause it does seem like if you're on the phone, things are more clear, but one of my garbled statements was this, and that's why I'm sharing my screen. I had this sort of notion that every time groups discuss this topic, they get together, um, and it's, the, it's, it's a set of, you know, a dozen or so sprawling issues. And I just sort of thought uh, to try to get my mind around this and to, you know, regularize this unwieldy area with so many pre-analytical variation sources and uh, differences in reagents and then protocols. And, you know, it's, it's rife with these issues that detract durable value generation in the images that we all are, uh, see as a main work product from these consortia. So I just attempted to memorialize yesterday's conversation and create a spider diagram. And, and in my head, uh, I've got the, the distance away from the center point on this would be how much resource allocation you would like to see created uh, uh, or see put into squashing these areas uh, of challenges. So um, it's, uh, I guess I'd first like to put up the problems, like, so what are some other sources? Um, and is, is this the best map that you can create? So if you, if you know what a spider diagram looks like, you, you sort of create a spider web. And like, if, uh, like as Emma, uh, who I hope will join us here, but Emma Lundberg has lived a lot of this at the Human Protein Atlas for some years. And like validation, she described four different ways and that this was a big resource allocation to, to do validation. So that might be big. And then um, Stephen was talking about multi-teaching families and he can reiterate that in a moment. Um, but so this, the, the web that you create would be what you'd like to see and, and that um, is all I'll say is, a, is a, uh, it, so if people have other problems in this area that could be put on different um, axes on this, what will be a web, then you could look at, well, how, how are we, you know, it's, just, it's a dashboard, a radar screen for strategic uh, resource allocation. So let me um, open it to some thoughts on that general topic. And pretty soon we'll move into 11A. We'll just take these serially, 11A, B, C, and D. Um, so what do people think about problems? And if you want to have another subtopic like 11E something, that can also be uh, dealt with. So I'll stop there. So Neil, put the spider diagram back up. I, I think okay. it's brilliant. I, I think it's a beautiful diagram. Um, I think it, it has a, a great deal of value putting it in this fashion. Um, it's interesting, you talk about weighting it and, and using it in one way or another. However, in some ways, I look at it as a possibility of um, using it as a, a life cycle planning system. And that is, you know, where do you start and how do you work your way around? Because this is not a one time, oh, we go down a path and stop. It really is a life cycle. You know, we are going to 
create a series of antibodies, carry out a series of validations, then evaluate other elements. I'm not sure it's in the quite the same, the right order, although it may be. And I think, you know, all of these approaches are, are appropriate. I'll shut up there. Yeah, we're getting some resonance Great. with Andrea. It's great. It's great. Yeah. Go ahead. I think it's a great uh, representation. I, I, I think just to follow up on uh, Stephen's comments is uh, maybe we need to do this in a staggered approach. I mean, maybe it's things are contextual. So in terms of what we are, what we can do today, maybe we, there's a priority of some sort that we may need to think about, or should we do this in parallel? Uh, you mean for the session today, like uh, to, to go through in serial fashion or? or... Right. Because these are all yeah, well, important we're... issues and you know, each one of them, yeah. Yeah, so my notion was to get, get buy-in with this as the framework and then ask for people in about a five minutes of, our, of a general session, like what other axes would you put down? Um, or uh, we can dive right in to the, to the set of issues, which are, um, you know, on, on this slide here, uh, like affinity reagents for organ scale cell phenotyping. And then, and then we'd come back to the spider diagram um, with 11B and 11D. Um, so I think that this is a, yeah, that what is the star? We should just go ahead. I think we need to work our way through. Okay, so I think diving right in um, uh, in serial fashion, and I still think we have less than. Uh, eight active participants so um but but uh all comments welcome here i think we've got a really uh good starting point so um yeah so what what do what do uh folks think about um the list here and uh any any initial additions what what isn't captured because i can append this Or, or what are, for the existing set, what do folks think are especially important to really uh, lift the baseline in, in spatial imaging based on antibodies and affinity reagents? I think the validation is one of the top things. It is not only costly and time consuming, it must be done for every platform. So that is, I think, the major Thing we need should focus so, on. So I think we should just stop our frozen tissue versus uh, FFA. I think we yeah, so uh, missed you on the last comment. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't quite hear that, Elizabeth, uh, but I think you're saying that that's an important one, the FFPE versus frozen tissue. That is a huge source of difference. Uh, any that strike people is not, uh, you know, really, you know, that might, um, like one, one thought is that the covalent tagging, like, like, so in our RTI for the hub map, our little side project for hub map is to assess this with a very focused little study design, you know, that would just try to answer the question when you tag up your antibodies, with covalent alterations, how does that change the proteiforms that are pulled down? The the how does it affect the affinity reagent? So we we have a little miniature study design. We'll have the results in like you know a year or a year. That's an example of small resource allocation. Um, An important one, considering um, you know the tag on to these are becoming more and more populations. We're really having trouble hearing you, Shannon. Yeah, we're, we're, we're catching like 
three words out of ten there, Sina. Maybe the chat. I'm going to look at the chat. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, any other thoughts in the next minute or two before we uh, drill down? So Neil, I just wanted to raise one quick question um, that how important is a bit of mapping in this whole scheme? Yeah, oftentimes the reagents are not, it, it, it's a, it, there's no like super quick scalable way that I'm aware of, um, especially when you have a complex epitope. Uh, so a native antigen that would be presented in say a, a frozen tissue uh, versus immunohistochemistry or FFPE type samples. Um, that that's very different and the, the epitopes can be complex to map versus just a linear, you know, eight amino acid segments uh, of an antigen being recognized by an antibody. Um, so it's, it tends to just by default get very short shrift. Like, you know, you, um, like it's something like it's one of the things we invest in least and I don't see that changing. Um, what do other folks think about that? So I'm aware of some epitope mapping technologies that can be run in high throughput. Um, right now, I would say it's moderate to lower just given the fact that some technologies need to move first and some need to move second. Um, I, although I think target variability is critically important, we can't get there until we have renewable antibodies and a few other issues solved. Um, yes, uh, Stephen, I totally agree with you. That's exactly what I was essentially referring to. That's important, but, but the throughput is in question right now. <clears throat> reagent side and multi-gene families have substantial roles right now because they're barriers for progress. And so, you know, I have a tendency, as I said earlier, to time order objects rather than value order them, just simply of what do I have to have from A to B to C. And a couple of these don't fit within that system. Um, I mean, renewable reagents have been a, a big, big deal in this space, starting back with NCI CP TAC and the mass spec studies. And both uh, even Pro, uh, Protein Atlas and CP TACs uh, antibody portal have been developing technologies to try and address those, but we need input, we need targets, we need other things. I think a, a really critical working group long term that we need to start thinking about is multi gene families because I don't know what others think, but increasingly people are asking me to drill into those ta targets and I just kind of shrug my shoulders, um, especially when they're transcription factors. Yeah, so it is possible to get um, ground truth on what isoforms and gene families come down in an immunoprecipitation uh, with mass spec. Um, and that's part of what our little group, that's, what, that's our main function while uh, to, to do that on, you know, something on the order of 50 targets or so in, in, in the mid-range future. Um, we have data on RAS. So when you do an IP on KRAS, you get HRAS and NRAS pulled down along with it, and uh, we've, we've, that's our sort of hydrogen atom in this example. But it is, it, so it is possible to get clarity on the isoforms and PTMs and, <clears throat> and, and across different tissues. Um, so at least you could get that uh, compositional analysis of what gets pulled down in an IP, which is sort of a linkage to validation. Uh, it, it, because one of these four ways of validation uh, is IPMS. And uh, Emma did a great job uh, enlisting just, and just for this group, uh, 
I have notes from yesterday. Emma's uh, the voice of experience there was saying, well, IPMS is a validation method. Gene silencing, so if you silence your target, it should go away if you have a good antibody in your image. Uh, GFB tagging was a minor part, um, but she also would use multiple affinity reagents um, or, yeah, different epitopes, basically, to try and look at, say, the N-terminal part or the C-terminal part of a target and generate images and see if that they are concordant or coherent. Um, so that validation actually can split into four different uh, parts to the web, and you can get granularity that way. Um, but, yeah, over the next, say, two, three years, um, the resource allegation and then time ordering, I, I, Steve, I, I get, I'll capture that uh, somehow, or Elizabeth, as you scribe. Uh, yeah, we need a, a, a battle plan, basically. Um, and there is a group that formed out of yesterday. So let me, let me go back to this. this uh, here you go, form a cross consortia working group. This is out of uh, 4A from yesterday in the topic area that's very similar. Um, so that was aimed to publish a study in 12 to 15 months, tightly designed to use a few antibodies on uh, two different platforms for spatial imaging. So maybe this working group can uh, come up with that battle plan. Like that, that might be, you know, here's a framework to think about it. Uh, relative importance as a surrogate for a resource. We don't have to say resource allocation in this diagram. It could be just sort of like what the community wants to see. And then time order is that battle plan. Do, do you like that, uh, Stephen, as a process for this group? It seems reasonable. I'm looking, I, I, I think it, it works. I'm looking at the, at the spider diagram again, and it, it's, as a spider diagram, it's almost, well, it is, it's two-dimensional. And really, in truth, it's three-dimensional because the, the uh, behavior of epitope mapping, uh, target variability, multi-gene families, and renewable antibodies have at least two layers, one for frozen and one for FFP. It's like they sit on top of each other. It's slightly skewed differently. That doesn't mean that this isn't a good model. It's just the nature of what we're working on. Yeah, it's that huge dimensionality to this is why you can't get your arms around it as a, everybody's, uh, like, how do you make this world more regular and, and deterministic? And um, Well, one of, one of the challenges, and this came up in one of the calls yesterday, and I thought I touched it well, is people want ground truth. And in truth, there is no perfect ground truth across these systems. You, you have to work with a uh, supported or normalized or artificial ground truth. And until that ground truth is proven to be um, wrong, you stick with it. And at which point, when you know it's wrong, then you evolve your ground truth. Um, veritas vos liberabit, chaos uh, veritas. Um, is the Latin for it. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, there. Yeah. I think one of the problems of validation, as we all know, I don't need to remind this group, you guys all know better than I do, that um, validation is asset specific. So, you take one antibody, you know, that's <laughs> good for chip assay, let's say, against transcription factors. Um, but it might not be good in something like cut and run assay. Uh, conversely, if something is, is very good in cut and run assay, it might not work with, with chip seek. So validation is really assay specific. Given one antibody might work in one assay, it might not work in other assay. It does not mean that the antibody is not good. So would it make sense? I think Neil, we had some discussion with you earlier. Would it make sense to have a set of antibodies and then try to see that how many assays used in, in various consortium those antibodies will be good for? 
said, this uh, no, I think I, I second what you just said. The antibody validation is going to be very acid dependent. We already know that when we validate antibodies for cell dive, we always start with IHC validated antibodies, and many of those fail on our fail on our platform because we have a different antigen retrieval protocol, and we are using immunofluorescence versus brown staining. And we have looked at over 1,000 different antibody clones, and so far we have only found about 350 to 400 that actually work. Yeah, so we have also analyzed uh... 1600 antibodies in a program called protein capture reagent program. These are all antibodies against transcription factors, the, the human proteome, if you will. Uh, and only maybe 20 to 30 percent of these antibodies, maybe 20, I think the exact number is around 26 percent of these antibodies are good for chip exoassay. However, when you go to the chip seek assay, that number drops to like three or four percent. If you go to now then storm analysis with the same set of antibodies, then you see that maybe about 35 to 40% of these antibodies are good for staining. So it's, it varies widely. It does. I think your point's well taken. You know, there, there is some structural hierarchy about how antibodies will perform across platforms and in locations. It's not rigid. It's not perfect, but more concerningly, sometimes it, it's less appreciated about the nuances where antibodies that work for CHIP really are more uh, uh, tertiary confirmation driven antibodies and may or may not work well in imaging space, depending on whether it's a specimen that's fixed or frozen and what antigen retrieval, whereas antibodies that work in immunohistochemistry have a tendency to be happy little antibodies and ELISA's, not really right. our topic. But, exactly. but also will also frequently demonstrate better performance in a Western blot. So you end up with this <laughs> exactly. challenge in the validation, the four-way validation. If you over leverage a assay as the gold standard in validation, you harm different arm. Because I've seen beautiful data multiple times showing poor Western blot, beautiful in vivo imaging support with knockdowns, knock-ins, whatever you wish to use, to demonstrate the antibody has the specificity you would like. So, you know, nothing is fixed in this system. It is a floating system with reference to validation. Right, exactly. So. Yes, I, I completely agree. That's a great point. I think, you know, Stephen's uh, earlier point that, you know, there is no ground truth. I, I don't think we can get to an ideal antibody that works across platforms in all conditions. So I guess it's going to be specific to the question we are asking, you know, is it? So I, I, I think definitely we need to set some thresholds of tolerance and then work from there. Yeah, so that's, that's the reason what I was suggesting is that if we start with the set of antibodies and Again, I don't know how far this is going to be practical in terms of scaling up, but if we start with a set of antibodies, particularly in, in a consortium like HubMap, and then see how these antibodies behave in certain assays, whereas uh, whether this antibody that, that Neil is using for his uh, uh, top-down uh, mass spec approach is, is good for what uh, Sinem is doing in, in antibody tagging, um, it might be or somebody using it in Codex or maybe TOF uh, could be totally different. Uh, so the use of the antibody that this antibodies is good for X, Y, Z, but not good for A, B, C is probably going to be the best way of starting it because as we are discussing that there's not going to be any universal antibody that's going to be good for all the assays that you do, most likely not. I believe that is the plan for the hub map that we will be looking at some common targets and common antibodies. Uh, we just had uh, common tissue distributed to different uh, groups. 
to evaluate their protocols, I think the next step is now to decide on targets and antibodies. Um, so, so here. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I hope it comes better on the phone now. Um, so much better, I much think, better. Yeah, I agree with the last last um, suggestion, and maybe it might actually even make sense to construct different lists for that are relevant to different applications, because in the end, it will really need to be an application-based validation. So not everything needs to be you know validated by IP if they are not going to be used for. Um, you know, like there might be different subsets that are useful for different applications. So we might also not really push for one common list, but have a few different lists that will be relevant for different applications. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is the <laughs> same as the good news. And that is, this is the first really functional discussion that moves this beyond what people have been struggling with. Um, and it really may mean that we do have the basis for what we would generally call a white paper of these are the issues that we've identified. These are the balances of the trade-offs. This is the state of the art. Right. And you know, I've, I've actually worked on a white paper on this topic for a couple of years and it's failed. But this spider diagram gives us enough to really come forward and, and make some progress here, identifying the challenges that we need to deal with. Um, so Stephen, let me jump on that. Cause, cause people, great consortia have taken big chunks and, and had them for dinner of this problem, right? So like the CP TAC group, um, HPA, if you combine what they've done, they've taken it uh, and, and, regularized pieces of this um, and so in a white paper that would that would come out with a sort of general battle plan or prioritization of uh, these different axes um, yeah that's something that doesn't repeat what uh, there was a great article on the validation by uh, you know this validation axis uh, the reason that we could prioritize this high is because of all the work that other people have done. But I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of anything that does capture the, the, all of these issues. And so if that's a goal we'd like to put out there for say a year from now. Um, so, so Neil, there's, there's a whole bunch of really great manuscripts about validation. I've written them, other people mm -hmm. have written them, whatever, but they are not, balanced across this problem and they don't provide a guidance for somebody who's walking in the door to confront this and that's really why a white paper is needed um and, and you know right now multi uh, multi-gene families um you know i'm the one who raises the flag but i think everybody is just kind of staring at their shoes and including myself and so yeah <laughs> no, I, I think this is the time where we take the literature that's existing we, we put it out there, we cite it, and we cite where it's in sync and where it's contradictory to each other. And then we point out the, 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 the black spaces that need to be addressed. Um, uh, you know, writing white papers is, a, is an art. There's no doubt about it. Um, and as I said yesterday on, the, on the, one of the sessions, I said, you know, I think this meeting, two things are happening. One, this meeting is getting enough people in the room. None of the consortia are big enough to have th their own teams that can write the papers. We're, but we're stronger as a group. And oddly, we've got to look at the bright side of life, is um, the COVID shutdown is giving us some, some, some bandwidth because <laughs> you know, we can't collect data. Most of us are collecting so much data, we're buried in data right now, data's off. And so we can go and work on trying to solve these problems. So we, we take what we've been given. Stephen, can I just uh, say something about the point you just made? Um, I, I think the point you made is exactly right in that you know, the person walking in the door, which that's out there, there's lots of examples of validation, um, but we're one of those examples. So we, we're mass spectrometrists that are starting to do codex and MXIF and these things. So we're trying to go out and see, okay, what is the community doing what's the proper way to validate and it's really kind of all over the place and it's hard nobody has a very concise for imaging you know here's exactly what you need to do 
conjugation all the way up through uh, validation of specificity and, and, that, and that sort of thing. So having a, a single white paper that walks you through all of those steps on, on what's agreed upon as the minimal standard, I think would be very powerful. Yeah. Steve, you're muted. You're muted, sorry, Steve. I think you're talking about two different papers actually at that point. We've got one that's a little higher level and the one that you're talking about has substantial value as well. Um, you know, a white paper is never the end of a, a, a of the road to be quite honest. Um, you know, I, 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 when I go back and, and look at the spider diagram, just having simple high level discussions about frozen versus paraffin conjugation technologies versus label technologies, which we are discussing as different animals, but I'm not convinced there is difference as we always think they are. They perform different than we think they do. They perform different, there's no doubt, but I'm not sure that if you get to the bottom of it, they're that different. So I think that there's a couple different opportunities here and it's not, not getting pushback from me, it's saying, I think we need to outline that one as a secondary, uh, as, a, as another, as, as an effort. I'm not even going to say second effort. I think we just outline it as an effort. So one thing uh, about, I mean, uh, we have definitely seen after certain conjugations, antibodies using specific completely. This happens especially with, you know, some DNA probes because you attach this negatively, highly negatively charged thing unspecifically onto the antibody and then for some antibodies that you know just create nuclear background. So there are these kind of problems that happen and then you know the DNA barcode antibodies are becoming more used, let's say, by different technologies. Um, so it's unclear basically what is the failure rate or anything like that. So I think that's still something to consider in the context of multiplex imaging as that is becoming one of the most used tools in general. Um, so that, you know, there is maybe it's secondary to some of the more general problems, but I think that's still an important problem. I, I, I think it's a major problem. I think that a lot of it has to do with how you look at it. And once we have a, a more robust ripping apart of the challenges, we'll find where they're different, where they're similar. I think you point out a good example about the nuclear detection capacities and the charges. There's a great different example where, yeah, this is a big deal. Whereas others are more nuanced about, well, how many label molecules did you apply and how much damage did you do to binding? That one, you know, what you see is, depending on how the covalent attachments are made, is something that's shared across labeling technologies. Uh, for, for the next few years of, of these consortia too, you know, I, I think, uh, if, if you think about uh, like what scale would epitope mapping need to go to or, or any of these set approaches, right? To be able to do it at say a couple hundred targets. Uh, those are genes for which we want to know uh, pr mainly protein-based imaging, of course, is the context of this, but RNA and other, you know, these are other considerations. But I, I, is that the scale that we would need to, um, or, or would we like to try to reach for 2,000 targets within two to three years? Am I, or would you say we should focus on just 20 and just those are the core 20 for which we're gonna try and, uh, you know, try and get on top of some of these uh, sources of variation? I would say there's, there's a priority list where you've got, you know, maybe 15, 20 markers that everybody is having to use one way or another and that different technologies suddenly have markers beyond that for which they really provide great information. I mean, you know, I look at all these technologies and, and uh, they all to me provide useful but different information. None of these technologies uh, um, override another technology necessarily. They're all different. They all have strengths and weaknesses. And so, you know, ultimately, Technology is going to have strengths for which certain antibody groups, families, whatever, are going to have value to them. But, you know, most commonly, especially segmentation type markers are something that we're all somewhat dependent upon of name that cell, uh, name that tune, name that cell. And that's, that's a complex <laughs> little game. I, I think that 
people struggle with name that cell. And I'll be honest, I think if you use the paradigm of the old, you know, uh, 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 TV show, name that tune, you actually learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I could name that cell in three markers. What, what's exactly. the top marker? Seg what's, what's the top segmentation marker that you think of? Is there one like that would segment cell types or, or, or just that people use as like a way to maybe plasma membrane or something? Well, it, it's almost like learning to play guitar. You know, there's some chords you got to know because you can't play any tunes. And then there's some really wicked chords out there that you don't use really commonly. And so, you know, if you're separating an epithelial cell from a lymphoid cell, life's not so hard. But if you're looking for that NK cell, my Lord, you know, life gets uh, difficult. That's that <laughs> rare chord you use. Yeah. CD markers often serve this function. Go, go ahead, please. We've got two, three minutes left. I, and this has been great. I think we've, I, that's how I think. I think sort of like, how do I get my mind around something? And, and, and that's been our, uh, we identified a lot of the problems. We'll come back in the afternoon and, and go, you know, be good little boys and girls and go through <laughs> these, these uh, four different areas and try to get our blue box um, done in 75 minutes, uh, kind of 15 minute break. So, but other sure. thoughts, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things, Neil. So we do have a couple of small studies currently undergoing that where we are going to look at the fresh frozen as well as FFP samples. And all our antibodies are validated on FFP tissue, but we're going to try to see how they work on the uh -huh. fresh frozen. Uh -huh. So we will have <laughs> some data to share, certainly with the Hub group, but we can make it more public. Anoop, um, uh, you know, the, key, the yeah. key thing would be the targets, the genes that you're going after, the gene products, of course, is what I mean to say, but yeah. the target list, because you, you, is this, two to, knowing the two to three key core targets that you are benchmarking your technologies on would be great, because then it could, you could put it into this set, or, or they're candidates to go into this. Sure, list. We're, uh, we're probably going to yeah. look at the, probably a dozen targets. Uh, okay, well, so it does. Uh, we yeah. Haven't made a list, but we can certainly provide that later on. And the yeah. other thing I was going to say, talk, talking about the segmentation markers, we do a lot of different segmentation. Uh, we have some membrane, plasma membrane segmentations, cytoplasmic segmentation, as Stephen mentioned, the uh, epithelial versus trauma, which is fairly straightforward. And then we have a number of uh, CD markers for uh, mapping different immune cell types. And I know a lot of people have those. It's just a matter of combining the right set of uh, CD markers to identify different cell types. And there are going to be some immune cells that are really going to be difficult to uh, map out because there is just so many some of the targets are expressed on many, many different immune cells, and there is no unique marker for some of these. I, right. Um, we, um, okay. Uh, I just want to offer things. If you could go to your diagram. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so if you could show the beautiful diagram, I just want to point out our technologies uh, in development is that could potentially make uh, add more, more tissue conditions uh, in addition to for the and also the existing platforms are constantly evolving that changes how we can uh, modify uh, antigens. Uh, and even obtaining like the additional treatment required uh, from uh, platforms could yeah, also be clear. Yeah, yeah. Craig, here. I tell you what. what uh, why don't we come back with your thoughts right as we launch in? Because that uh, we were catching every two or three words out of ten there for you, and it's uh, maybe two words out of ten. So uh, bottle that, table it. Uh, for 15 minutes 
and uh, then we'll come back and lead off with Craig Hoon. Yeah, any any thoughts uh, before we get it going in about a minute um, from Stephen about how the 75 minutes, you know, how do you best want to use it? Well, we're supposed to change directions and look at solutions. Um, the spider diagram was back up. I might give you a couple other discussions, but one possibility is going ahead and outlining a white paper. It seems like the kind of obvious situation we're at based on what's come across my email already. I can, um, yeah. I can provide some generic input based on what all the groups are getting, if that's helpful. I've gotten, Neil, I got a couple more emails that you may not have gotten on that topic. So that tells me it's got traction. Wow. Yeah, great. Well, that's uh, wheels hitting the road and grabbing. Um, okay. Yeah, that's so, the critical thing. We yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, Kwang Hoon, um, why don't you go through your riff and uh, we, the, the subtopics are, uh, we, we've actually already hit uh, two and a half of them pretty hard, uh, so we could drill mm -hmm. into them. But uh, the one that we didn't is the organ scale cell phenotyping. So we're going to hand the mic over to Quang Hoon for the next several minutes. Uh, take us wherever you like. Sounds good. So I'm going to discuss the, one of the subtopics on the affinity reagents for organ scale cell phenotyping. And I that most of you are not probably not familiar with uh, the emerging tissue organ clearing whole organ phenotyping techniques. So I will just briefly introduce uh, uh, what what the techniques new platforms are and what it can do and why uh, developing and validating new affinity reagent is crucial for these uh, emerging platforms. So I'm going to share uh, my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Not yet. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes, now we can. OK. So, um, so here is a quick summary of the um, tissue whole organ uh, Transformation and clearing techniques. Uh, these are uh, technologies developed uh, from my lab, but there are many other groups developing uh, similar types of technology. So I will just quickly go through them. So this is a technique that uh, transforms whole mouse brain into uh, optical transparent form by preserving uh, endogenous proteins and other molecules at their physiological location. So this allows us to access these endogenous uh, proteins in intact tissue using uh, affinity reagents like antibodies and we can image intact tissue uh, without mechanical sectioning. And uh, this is another technique called SHIELD and in this technique we use a fixative that is, uh, hasn't been used uh, for uh, tissue preservation. So introducing this kind of new uh, tissue preservation can also uh, 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 add another challenge in validating antibodies because these positives can pose uh, a unique modification of epitopes. Also, there are other techniques on uh, synthetic, synthetic gel-based and that, that some techniques makes uh, tissue expanded and allows for resolution imaging of whole organ. So using these techniques, uh, we can basically extract multi-scale information uh, from all the way from organ uh, wide distribution of uh, antigens, cell uh, different cell types, all the way down to subcellular architectures. Um, and I will just show you a couple of examples here. Can you guys see this video? Is it running well? Yeah, and I. Uh, so yeah, this is just a video showing. Uh, Marmoset uh, visual cortex uh, intact tissue cleared and we stained it with uh, MPY Y antibody and you can see cell body locations and in June you can see more details. For example, uh, here, uh, same data set we are zooming in 
and uh, because the resolution is high enough, because we are mapping these uh, antigens in 3D, uh, we can also characterize the morphological details of individual neurons. And in the case of uh, a brain, uh, we can also map the connectivity as well. So I just want to uh, let you know, guys, that there are emerging technologies uh, uh, that uh, basically uh, really ex extends the utility of this affinity reagent. And there are unique uh, challenges in uh, developing and validating affinity reagents for this kind of uh, technical platforms. One is that uh, many existing antibodies are not compatible with these emerging technologies because these emerging technologies use unique tissue preservation uh, uh, method. And also after staining, a uh, stained sample uh, needs to be further processed in, uh, uh, in chemical solutions such as methanol, organic solvent, or, or other types of uh, buffers. So that could also cause dissociation of antibodies. So there is another, another challenge there, and uh, poor specificity of commercially available antibodies and uh, lack of antibody for newly identified targets. And also for organ scale applications, you need to use enough antibodies to uh, get good enough signal uh, organ-wide, and that requires a large amount of, so the cost associated with using large amount of antibodies is also another challenge, unique challenge. So I will stop here and... So, actually, uh, this is really nice. Uh, how much antibody do you, do you typically use per centimeter cube of the tissue? It depends on, it really depends on the target. Uh, but usually, yeah. uh, even even highly expressed targets like histone H3, uh, we can use one microgram to label or like 100 million cells in pore mass, which is about cubic centimeter. But some highly abundant uh, targets, we need to use 10 microgram or even more than that. 10 microgram per mil, or I mean, how much uh, so, volume? Yeah, the concentration is uh, for these applications, concentration is not that important. But the absolute amount, the total amount of antibody is uh, mm. important. And yeah, when we use like about 10 micro, one to 10 microgram total, and the concentration that we use is, uh, I'll say, uh, point to microgram per milliliter. That's not not really that bad. So the amount yeah, it's not, that, not that. Yeah. So I was going to try to. There was better. actually a discussion yesterday in one of the other breakout sections about going from two D to three D. I think focus over there mainly was about the the cell based approach, but suddenly it looks like uh, there are a number of approaches that have you done any comparison between these or comparison between uh, what kind of platforms? different clearing approaches? Oh yeah, so we are actually uh, in the process of doing that. So. Uh, I'm leading a team uh, under uh, Brain Initiative, uh, BICCN uh, Consortium, and to validate, to develop and validate about 3,000 monoclonal antibodies against 300 targets uh, for uh, right. five different technology platforms, like different tissue clearing or different tissue transformation techniques. And yeah, it's really platform dependent. It's really uh, mm -hmm. technique dependent. So I, I agree with you and, and many uh, others who uh, uh, shared this uh, in the first session that uh, validation has to be uh, done for all the different platforms and technologies. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, great. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, trying to get uh, isotropic imaging 3D, though, that's just, yeah, it just highlights the need for a better control over all these things we've been discussing. <clears throat> um, other thoughts on uh, 11A there? I guess the uh, other question I would have is about the imaging time. Are there any hurdles there? How long does it take to image that 3D volume? Yeah. So imaging of like core mouse organ, like uh, mouse brain, only takes like 40 minutes per channel. So if you do three, four channel immunolabeling and do whole organ imaging at uh, like one, one to two micron voxel resolution, it takes about 40 minutes per channel. So uh, if you image four channels, it's uh, 160 minutes using lighted microscope. Still not bad. Yeah. So what are the challenges other than having to validate all these antibodies for these platforms? It looks like uh, uh, that say that again? the major challenge. Uh, yes, the validation of these antibodies is a major challenge. And also, I mean, there are a lot of commercially available antibodies out there, uh, but uh, we have been testing over thousands of antibodies uh, any of them are not not really compatible, um, and, and it's, I cannot imagine a, like individual labs in this kind of large scale uh, validation uh, for their. I think uh, like um, multi -group, multiple groups working together to validate commercially available antibodies and also newly developed antibodies and make the validation data available for the community would be really important. Mm -hmm. uh, Casey, so those 3,000 monoclonals you are now validating, they will be for the SHIELD commission, so they will be validated for the particular application. Is that the plan? So, so what we've been doing, uh, we, we just started this project. We are developing this monoclonal antibodies, and we are testing them against uh, the formatted fixation, so which is old standard, basically. Uh, and, and shield preserved tissue and also uh, synthetic hydrogel uh, preserved tissue, expanded tissue as well. So four or five different conditions. Uh, but hopefully within three years, we will develop 3,000 antibodies uh, against 300 targets. And we will have at least one, tar one antibody, monochrome antibody uh, that uh, is compatible with uh, each target, uh, PFA fixed uh, target, so that they so, can be used for the most uh, uh, widely used application. So, so that right there is a fascinating, you know, let me, let me just hold right there. What he just said was that there are 10 antibodies and he expects a 10% survival rate. So one antibody will be for a given target. So that's a 10 to one. Think about the inefficiencies of that. Um, so one of the things we could do in our, our white paper or our, our thing, like what validation technologies, and Spragans said the same thing in different way, but what validation steps would correlate to highly uh, u u useful antibodies in a variety of platforms. So if you could detect something in a validation step that, that correlated well with a proliferation of that throughout platforms, like that would be a high value validation step. Uh, so, I mean, and try to shrink this uh, 10 to one, where, where did you get that uh, quantum? Like you, and it's this exact same story, exact, it's a very similar story to what uh, Sean Bendel 
and his uh, colleague in crime out there in Stanford, uh, the other young fellow, um, like they just they just went through the antibody, the commercial antibody catalog, and triaged at approximately the same ratio, um, and found some that they call valid for their platform. Um, Ten to one. So, is, do you expect to that one? So you said three hundred targets, right? So three thousand antibodies. Uh, could you just yeah, expound so, a bit more on that? Come on. Yeah. yeah, so I, I, I want to uh, correct myself. So uh, 10 to 1, it doesn't mean that we test 10 antibody and only one antibody is compatible with, like, for example, PFA fixed tissue. Uh, that's not the case. So we start with, for example, like too many antibodies, and we test all of them on these different platforms, right? like five different platforms, PFA fixed tissue, shield preserved tissue, and uh, expanded tissue, et cetera. And, and some antibodies are compatible with PFA fixed tissue. It could be like two hours. And uh, some other antibodies can be compatible with shield preserved tissue. That could be three out of 20. So uh, at the end, yes, we need to test a large number of antibodies. Uh, which is very time consuming and uh, uh, requires a lot of uh, resources. Yeah. But I, I agree with uh, you, Neil, that we need to come up with a hybrid approaches in testing these antibodies. Uh, because the number of platforms and the, 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 the improvement in all these platforms requires us to uh, test these antibodies against many different conditions over time. Gotcha. Yeah, so what, what uh, we are actually trying to improve also this uh, spinning uh, throughput. And one, one thing that is working quite well for us is that uh, after uh, the antibodies are developed, which the, uh, antibodies are developed by a company called CDI, and they have this protein array. It's an array of like 15,000 uh, human protein antigens, uh, basically uh, arrayed on slide glass. And they test antibody first on those uh, protein arrays. And then they uh, send us antibodies that cats and uh, specificity only for the target. And then we test those uh, antibodies that pass the first in on uh, tissues and uh, the success is much higher uh, than just trying all the antibodies on tissue uh, type. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I think in your own, I've, there was a 617 number that someone mentioned shield or a, um, some large scale effort. Can can you uh, reiterate that for the scribe so we can capture that uh, that group? It was a six one seven number ending in eight eight five seven. Maybe you captured. Sorry, I think it. that's uh, that's me. That's Tina. Oh, hi. Yes. Oh, okay. Got it. Sorry. Yes, thank that, you. That, just like connected through phone, couldn't have number there. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, so did we capture that? Uh, that sounded like a big enough group, you know, cross consortia. Oh, you, so what was the group? For, oh. uh, so, no, Shield is a technique that Kwangun's lab is developing. Mm. We are hoping to maybe utilize some of those tools. Uh, for a 3D imaging also in part of HubMap. So we're hoping to actually publish a collaboration to bring in maybe some of those tools they're developing for the brain uh, initiative as part of HubMap uh, as well in the you know next years. We that's that's what we included in our UH3 proposal um, for our technology development efforts as part of HubMap. So we'll see how much progress we can also make for about that. Right. Yeah and coming on what what consortium are you part of again? I'm part of uh, Brain Initiative BICN, uh, Brain Initiative Sensors Network. 
actually Yong Yao, the program manager, uh, uh, is joining our uh, now. Um, so under that consortium, uh, we are. I have two two projects uh, going on. One is mapping the human brain using basically antibody-based uh, proteomic imaging uh, approaches. The other is uh, collaborating with um, Chad Hopkins and the city, uh, the company called CDI to develop uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, for 300 targets for the neuroscience. So it's neuroscience. Right. And is that is that target list uh, public or shareable within consortia or? It, it's been developed within cons consortia. So uh, we just started this project like September uh, last year. Um, and we have now about like 50 to 100 targets uh, identified, uh, recommended by uh, many, many PIs participating in the consortia. And we are in the process of ending that uh, target. And I will be happy to share the list, current list with uh yeah even just to see the 50 50 neuro target so so uh, let me just shift to um 11 c uh, on our item it's tar it's called target selection and, and proteins of interest subtopic um we already hit 11 b with steven so we're good there um and 11 d we, we we touched on variation and imaging Technology. So I, I, I think what we're going to do toward the end of this group, we have, we have 50 minutes left. That's a large chunk of time. Um, so at some point we'll pivot into the blue box and actually drilling down on it, creating an outline for uh, a white paper um, that memorializes this chat and, and try to set up a next, maybe a monthly uh, half hour check-in for starters might be a goal. Um, so for target selection, you know, the, uh, within HubMap, I think we will approach 200 targets and there's a spreadsheet running around. Um, it seems like with the different organs and tissues, like the targets could be linked to those different organs and tissues and that would be a way to uh, bring in lots of consortia like the brain I didn't even think about the brain but obviously they'd be wanting you know they're gonna have a list of 300 sounds like and 50 might be available uh, soon um, having uh, tissue specific lists of targets what do what do folks think about that? Uh, is that feasible to do? Is that a way to communicate? I'll stop there. Hey, Neil, could you elaborate a little bit sure. on what you meant by tissue specific target? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, in the brain, uh, like I was riffing off of. Quang Hoon and pivoting over to subtopic 11C here about target selection. Like, how do we how do we pick targets? Because it, it, it uh, within HubMap, there's it, it's healthy human tissue, and there are six different organs, um, at least uh, six different tissues, and um, there is biology around each one of those. So it, it seems like a, you know a target like uh, P53 might be of interest for the H10 or uh, NCI related, uh, uh, you know, it could be a cancer panel that is uh, brought in. Um, I don't know how that would hit on the top of the organs in a, in a healthy, you know, nominally we're mapping the healthy human body. Um, so disease-centric picking of targets is one piece of this. I opened up with just 
someone who knows about that biology for, say, the kidney and podocytes, okay, how can you not have this target? I don't know, insert your favorite podocyte kidney target here. Um, you know, if you, if you said, I want a 25 or 30 target for each organ or tissue, and for the brain, I'm hoping Tuan Gan will send me that list of 50. Is that a useful way to get something under a few thousand, uh, under a thousand targets that then are, you know, manageable in some way, that we have a prioritized set of targets? That, that's what I'm rooting around for. Um, another one is like uh, Richard Conroy mentioned, the disease, but like an oncology set, like here's your 20 targets that really are assembled in a thoughtful way and that imagers and others could could tackle. So I'm, I'm very unstructured about this, so I know it's hard to discuss the nebulous points I'm, I'm making, but I'm rooting around for what's my primary index for which I will prioritize uh, targets, oh. which are genes, yeah. If you think you're unstructured, I'm even more unstructured. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll be honest, I've stepped back and said, I don't have enough data yet to tell me what my next level is. Um, I think it really is fit for purpose, and it's going to depend on the topic. It limits one direction, normal tissues another. The wood goes here, B and T are in different directions. Um, you know, there are some groups that are, that are further down the road on this. Uh, one men's group clearly has some idea in there about what they need to be able to have tool sets in lymphoid organs. But spinning that around may or may not mean you know the right data set for lymphoid cells in a solid tumor organ. And certainly don't know the right data set for a solid tumor organ. So I think the, the brain. Brain got a ton of data on, and say this is a good example of a place where we have some some starting place. So can I suggest something? This is this is more of a technical thing. I don't know whether this is going to help, but but everybody is breaking up, and we have seen in the past that if you start your videos, just have the audio on, it might help. Can we try that and see whether that helps, at least with the uh, with the reception, because everybody is breaking up. Yeah, is that is that true of me as well, Anand? Uh, no, yours is, is so far okay, um, but yeah. almost everybody is breaking up. Yeah, yeah, is that so even if, if everyone shuts that, off their video, it'll um, it allow the band to focus on audio. So the idea is that everybody do it. Kind of like yes. social distancing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, Steve yeah, maybe hit us again with, with, with your uh, points there. Go, uh, yeah. We caught maybe f uh, three or four words out of ten there. Okay, let's try this again. What my comment was is that I'm more than you are, and that I think that you can have to use the fit for purpose model. Now, I think that a few organs we have some clues. Clearly in CNS, there's, there's been a lot of data and we have a little bit better direction where we're going. Ron Germain's group probably knows lymphoid cells uh, within normal tissues and some uh, non malignant tissues. But if you start interfacing your know, lymphoid cells into solid organs, it's a little murkier. No doubt, solid organs have such complex signaling systems that, okay, well, you know, aerodigestive has one group, but there are differences. As soon as you crossed over to, let's say, GU, it's a whole different volume of signaling pathways. I'm also concerned that if we overfocus on it, we're, we're missing some really critical directions, and, and this does unmask my background. We pursued this from top down approach, meaning as a community. It, you know, it's unfortunate because I have to speak with my hands. I might as well be Italian. But in, sometimes we should revert the system and go development up and say, okay, if we're interested in this organ, let's start at its root development and work our way up to the other targets that it teaches us. So I try not to be too descriptive about what the uh, targets I'm looking at are. Got, got you. Yeah, we, we caught, uh, at least I caught, uh, eight words out of 10 there and much better uh, 
Yeah, and uh, right, so so your top-down versus bottom-up target selection and bottom-up has a major role to play, and that's kind of how we're rolling uh, in HubMap. And, um, and it sounds like in what Kong Hoon described that that's, there's some process underway that's uh, not super top-down structured within brain and they'll get there. Um, so that's a fine answer, right? And just start to start to see uh, how things bubble up and um, okay, I can, I can accept that answer. Hello? Hello. What happened, what happened to the audio? People cut off? I don't know what I think it's oh, no. Neil. I was getting ready to suggest to Neil. I'm looking at my schedule at 27 minutes. Or is that wrong? Yeah, that's about right. I guess the question uh, well, is. I think we we, we have until 12.30. Oh, so I've got uh, more time. More than four minutes, then it's time for me to shut up. Yeah, Potur, sorry, can you hear me now? Are you? Did you want to chime in? No, no, we couldn't hear you. You kind of cut off uh, abruptly, so we were wondering if you got cut off or not. So, so Neil, this is Neil and, and Stephen. This is Anand again. So what what is the recommendation in, in terms of target selection? If we can just bullet point one, two, three, what would those be? So I just wrote top down versus bottom. That's, that's as far as I have gotten. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I can, like I have. Uh, Segmentation, segmentation versus function. Maybe that's the whole discussion here is what are we trying to accomplish with our targets? And, and so, you know, you have segmentation, you have function, you may have differentiation, which is still different than function. What are the other ontologies that we might have with reference to target selection? We have yeah, a comment I, from Ron. Ron would like to make a comment on this. Yeah, I think um, we have to be very careful. One of the issues here is to integrate any of the imaging with all the molecular and, and nucleic acid-based approaches. If people are defining <clears throat> most of the, quote, new cell subtypes based on the single cell work, then the imagers are going to need to be selecting antibody probes to the largest extent possible that match what they define as characteristic marker sets for those populations that they already identified, because the interesting question is where are they in the tissues? For me, for it, just go off and on. And start making that has to be. We're not hearing you very well, Ron. I I think I caught it. The salient, the key thing was uh, the in target selection that it could be informed by how cell types will be defined, which he's I think he's saying will be RNA seq or single cell RNA seq, and that that's what we can anticipate for the future, and therefore target selection could be informed by that. Like, what are the primary uh, ways or the primary genes that end up defining uh, cell types uh, from the atlases underway and then the protein based technologies would come in informed by that as a primary organizational or at least one to consider but I'll, I'll make a note I hope I captured uh, the <coughs> core of that I've got a few notes of the boxes on the Google Doc, I'm trying to capture that. 
I, I think Ron's point is excellent. I think it is orthogonal to my comments, which I think is actually probably even more important and needs some more thought. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think we're going to have like one unifying crystallizing moment for target selection. Like it's a, it's a, uh, but I, again, we, we mapped uh, a kind of framework to think about the three or four main ways that you can think about it. Like earlier when we said, uh, let's do this white paper, and we, we, we then converged on the idea of it, there has to be a limited set of targets for the purpose of improving the technologies and improving efficiency. Uh, so that's a different question around target selection than the master uh, organizational principle, like would be a top-down target selection uh, for uh, uh, a consortium with its values. Uh, um, and so uh, I think we've laid out the, the three or four major ways to think about it. Um, but I think that is important though, Neil, that if what we try to do is to have consensus that these are the best ways of selecting targets, but uh, these are uh, what we thought were be, will be important ones, but there are also uh, um, problems here that we need to recognize. And I think that's an important lesson really to uh, let the community know that, that these are things that we can agree on and these are the things that we really need to think about yeah it, it, i hate to say it but it might be another spider diagram we had with just like four axes about target selection and how a given consortium is selecting its targets at least you could visualize what they prioritize yeah uh, Yeah, um, I was going to just bring up a, a target list that we had been kicking around, um, and we'll we'll sort of continue on for maybe five more minutes in 11C, then pivot to bring us toward the home stretch here. Um, so, Neil, regarding the target selection i just want to share our experience because this is topic that we have extensively discussed uh, within our group and we set some selection criteria uh, for for targets and uh, i can just share that quickly with with, with the team uh, with the group before we move on so our, our criteria is major set time markers with known functional significance that's one criteria and targets that, the second criteria is targets that we have well validated commercial antibodies for. Because the validation method that we use is uh, staining tissue with multiple antibodies against uh, the same antigen, but targeting different epitope. So it's, it's important to have well validated commercially available antibodies to uh, validate uh, the new antibody that we develop. And the third is targets with well-validated expression patterns. And the fourth criteria is targets covering a wide range of antigen types. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, yeah, before. totally, totally fascinating about how the brain group, um, you, you guys mapped this out. Uh, and when you say well-validated antibodies, that, um, did you drill down further into that? Yeah, so here we are validated uh, commercial antibodies. So I'm uh, emphasizing commercial antibodies. So um, <clears throat> when we validate antibodies, the approach that we use is using more than two different antibodies, monochromal antibodies, uh, targeting and uh, labeling the same antigen, but targeting different epitopes. And if we have good uh, well-validated commercial antibodies uh, here, well-validated meaning 
is that well, uh, we have two more than two commercially available antibodies labeling the same target, and uh, the, these antibodies are have, have been extensively used uh, by the community and uh, with a lot of references. And we also um, validate these antibodies in house. So that's the definition yeah. of well validated commercial antibodies. That, that is okay. very similar to the approach we have used too. We generally start with the two or three IHC validated antibodies and then go through a lengthy protocol of validation in house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it looks like, every, and Sean Bendel gave me the same sort of common experience. So if we could, yeah, tilt the tables a little bit toward a more efficiency where you could get an antibody and and use it with maybe less steps in house. That, that's a good aspiration. Um, I, I sort of jumped in here and sharing my screen. This this is the current aggregate. So to Stephen's point about bottom up um, organization. So we've just looked at the occurrence frequencies of people in HubMap at these early days, and so anti CD thirty one. Four people are interested in that, four different groups. So that would get more prioritization for let's, let's pound on that antibody, make sure it's good. Um, uh, and then here's the number of labs in HubMap focusing on different, I'm just sort of scrolling down. And that's an ex example uh, process anyway, uh, that sort of bottom up um, process. So yeah, I have, so, so target, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Neil. You can and I'll, I'll. No, no, I'm, I'm all good. Um, all right. I, I think so our target I was, selection, I'm, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Right. I was going to ask a general question to the group here. Uh, this is, again, based on, on my own experience and experience with, with the consortium that I'm running. That, so I'll give an example of antibodies against, uh, transcription factors, right? And the gold standard in the field is that if the antibody is good for chip or chip C, then it's great. The problem is that oftentimes you find that an antibody is giving you a very good chip signal, right? The, the issue is that whether it is recognized in an open chromatin region rather than a specific sequence. And oftentimes we see that in this validation effort, we found that the antibody is recognizing open chromatin region and giving a very good chip signal rather than a very specific target sequence. So the only way we can know that an antibody is good is to have a knockdown or a knockout. The question that the consortium here is that do you universally do it? What is the real specificity test for a given antibody that you follow? Right. Yeah, we uh, caught six words, seven words out of ten or so, and yeah, the knockout. So that that is sort of a ground truth or an apparent ground truth might be prioritized higher. Is what Anand is saying is like to do a knockout is really for for any platform. I think is your point. Like if you yes. <laughs> to have right, it, it's not. Yes. That's yeah. Yeah, so someone, I hope someone can capture that moment, like, because uh, anything that cuts across platforms could be really valuable reagents, right? So we need exactly. the CRISPR knock for non-essential targets. Um, and, it, and it wouldn't so much matter, it would, uh, cell lines would work, would they not? Yeah. Sure. Because it, it, if it's truly a null, uh, so that's an interest. That's a real interesting point, and it does go to sort of resource allocation to generate those cell lines, and so people could prove to themselves. Um, there's a, yeah. Uh, what the, I would I like to add to that, even though you can validate it on the full line for specificity, it does not mean it's going to work on tissue. Damn it, Anup. You you make things hard, but damn it, you're right. 
that, that is one point. And then the other thing is like, this is really about going all the way back to, you know, scratch. And this is, I think, especially for commercially validated antibodies, you should really not be needing to go all the way um, down there and start from scratch with like knockout, knockout cells and so on. Like we at least need to expect that the antibody that we are getting from commercial providers should be at least performing that. And then we could do the phase validation or like validation for our particular application. But really doing all the specificity testing from scratch is a huge effort and will be expensive and time consuming for all consortia in general. So this is at least where we need to you know, integrate probably the commercial providers and demand data that shows this antibody was specific for the target in these contexts, then we can do the application specific validation. I think that would be a bit more efficient in terms of research allocation. Yeah, well, so, so majority of the commercial antibodies uh, have very limited amount of validation. If we cannot really rely on it unless we can get yeah. a commercial partner was willing to spend effort on it. Exactly. So, so let me, so we're, let's swing out of target selection. I, I hope a scribe uh, caught that important. And I think I will, I will create a spider diagram, a spider diagram at some point that captures target selection. I am, I am confused on a higher level for target selection. And I thank this group for that. Uh, I've taken, control of the screen and, and just going to pivot back to uh, the validation um, and then we'll get back to uh, the last 20 minutes of like coming up with our blue box and our in our white paper um, so for validation um, I'm also confused on a much higher level Th this is what uh, Anup was saying you can't rely on the vendors right it's kind of like generally a, a known thought for your own platform that's certainly true you can take hints so within HubMap we're we're migrating toward a, a, a validation report that would come up in a target specific way so this one happens to be for mech one okay great um, and you do elevate yourself you don't reinvent the wheel so this one's from whatever, some vendor, Here, here's the vendor, and then there's the vendor data. And, you, and we actually can push vendors for more data. And uh, here's Thermo Pierce validating across eight different, uh, eight different cell lines. And I know the tissue will be different, but at least here's eight different cell lines. Um, and each of them has been done by Westerns and IEMS. And they actually characterize even fold enrichment. So this one got 314 fold enrichment um, as an average across these different cell lines. Um, we can even know uh, the copy number of our targets because of the large amount of uh, bottom-up proteomics that we do have estimates for what copies cell we're dealing with for certain targets um, and so aggregating this into a hub map uh, uh, framework or a, a framework to deal with this issue that people can drill down on look at the antibodies I think out of this conversation adding a platform compatibility and and that that's a valuable thing um, and then to do any other work that's layered on top. So like we're doing the top down part. So here's the MEC1 with uh, four phosphoproteiforms. And um, you know, we, you, it, it's gene specific, isoform specific, and ideally proteiform specific. Uh, and that's what, so that's what we're layering on top of uh, what's already known because there was a lot done on this this antibody. So, so if we could provide that and make it cross consortia, I think that's one way to raise the baseline of operations here. Um, uh, yeah, thoughts? No, this is nice. I mean, just adding more to it from different platforms. It's kind of aggregation approach. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and for our case, for example, we take the stem plate and add our conjugation, so the conjugated antibody and how it performs to compare to an unconjugated antibody and have like some bigger crops in this document um, as a second step for validating the conjugated antibody. Got you. So so that's where the plat so there'd be this whole other section in platform compatibility. Uh, so, so I'm so sorry, Sinem, what what's the, the name of your platform there at, at Harvard Med? Immuno Immuno Saber. There it is. Sorry. Uh, yeah. 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 So so if we were to, for this target, like let's say you're all uh, fired up about MEC1. Uh, okay, so that is a candidate for running a small study to look at the effects of conjugation for that target. Um, and I think we can do that on a dozen or so, uh, but doing it on the, the full set, right, th uh, that's probably too much. Uh, it just in terms of throughput and pace, cadence of, of things. Uh, so yeah, I'll capture that. Um, okay, so we've got maybe 20 minutes. Why don't we shift to the blue box? If everyone could pull up the the uh, web, uh, the Google the Google Doc. We're going to shift from green boxes to, to blue boxes. Put um, into the blue box by me. I have a crappy setup. Say again, Stephen. So things in the blue box, but as you'll notice, I'm crappy scribe. Plus, I got pulled out from the Okay, yeah, uh, Stephen said, okay, yeah, no, I'm, I started the scribing functions there in the blue box. Um, I think in the remaining time, we, like, okay, so whom might help, uh, I think Stephen and I are very energetic to try to keep momentum up on this, you know, um, uh, whom else might want to, you know, getting to a, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's concerning add me to this list. Anoop, thank you. That's tremendous. Like, yeah. uh, Unfortunately, I cannot uh, uh, enter anything on Google Doc because our company does not allow us to enter things on it. So I cannot I really type in. That's okay. We'll we'll deal with it in a. Um, Should be able to type uh, into the Google Doc, but I'm not an expert. I would suggest that's okay. We, we, we would suggest we take the diagram and put the very points that were identified on the spider diagram in as the starting point for a white paper, and then uh, try. Identify people who will take elements of each topic uh, and to develop teams on for each of those elements and we'll work from there. I mean, that's that's how we've done in the past is champions for every arm of the spider diagram and they have a whole big eye, uh, you know, keep an eye on that mind or on the big picture and, and uh, herd the cats. Oh. Okay, wow, that was great. Even at five words out of ten, uh, hearing you, yeah. He, so our goal here in the next uh, 19 minutes is to uh, have not just people assigned but uh, to the general project, but to specific arms uh, of the spider diagram and um, or specific parts, the, the major subsections of this uh, article, uh, which might end up being four to five display items in the main text and uh, say four major sub headings or four, if you were doing an outline of this, what Stephen just said is like, let's choose four 
distinct arms of this thing and who would be the, the champion in each of those arms. So I'll do this in the, in the, maybe I should bring up the spider diagram. Would that help people? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Let me do that. And then I'll also try and scribe in the name. So, so Anoop, of, of all the things you've heard today, like what, if you were to be uh, in charge of a major sub area uh, of this, do you know which one, how you would describe that? Yes. I would say the validation. In your diagram, there, are you showing? I, I, let's yeah, see. no, I'm just I have I, something. I have like 87 million windows up on three monitors, mm. and I'm. <laughs> let's uh, go back to the diagram up above. Yeah, is it is it up? Uh, no. It's uh, it, it's the next slide that's showing up. So one up. Something's not quite right. I'll, I'll get it right. Mm. But but actually, Stephen, if, um, let me step back. I, uh, so uh, great. Uh, someone or I'll capture in the the antibody validation part. A uh, Yeah. So but Stephen, maybe you could help me by what would what would let's take a step back. What would be the four major legs that are the pillars for this article? Um, question mark. So Neil, I suggest that, um, so one is target selection. The other one would be renewable reagents. The third one is going to be antibody modification. And the fourth one is going to be, the major one is going to be validation. Okay. Uh Hit me with those. I'm ready to describe it in there. Hit me. Hit me one more time. Just repeat. Okay. So the age, for age categories, um, my suggestion would have target selection. The second one is going to be renewable reagents. The third one is going to be. Um, uh, I forgot even what I said. Covalent indication. And the fourth one is the validation. Did you get that? I did. I got it. I got it. Um, okay. And then we'll put the other behind it as other topics or second heading area. So multi gene family, renewable resources. Valent frozen versus FFP. It's kind of like a double layered structure, maybe two sections section one, section two. Whether it's paper one, paper two, I yeah, okay. So I know that people can't see the blue box, but I am capturing an outline. Uh, I got it. Okay, so I've got the four things, and and I I fold in Stephen's comment. Uh, uh, the first one, I just I just called it target selection and variability. Uh, and so we have four sections. I I, I hope I'm clearly heard. Um, so the recommendations of what we want to do, create a working group with the goal of publishing a white paper with this outline. And number one, uh, target selection and variability. Do we have a volunteer to uh, focus? Can you read that? Oh, am I, am I breaking up? No, I, you should need the target selection and ability. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, I was going to maybe put Steven in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're not going to give him a chance to wriggle out of it. No, I don't election. I did not do part of selection. <laughs> well, you, how about the variability part? Renewable specialties, validations, and multi Yeah, shoot. Uh, I can only get three him, words out of ten. I think we should give him variability because. Uh... Okay. All right, that's what he said. All right, anybody who anybody like target selection and that that ten minute riff that we did? I could. Oh, I could do that. Someone yeah. nominated me. Yes. Okay. Oh, I was going to do the spider diagram anyway. Okay, done deal. Renewable reagent. Any, any volunteers? So I, I will volunteer. This is Ando, Ando Roy. Okay. Ananda. So yeah, just a matter of clarification. When you mean renewal, are we talking about scalability? I, I, I think that that's not the best header to describe everything that will be in that a pillar. Re renewable reagent. I think it, it means like clone selections, you know, monoclonal, good pipelines for antibodies. Could mean recombinant <laughs> antibodies. Could mean just better characterization. Right. Okay. And uh, Ananda's a big boy. He'll figure it out. Uh, and and Flynn people. Uh, misery loves company, so be sure to grab <laughs> other people. Um, uh, re reagent characterization. Um, CNAV is uh, particularly interested in that. Uh, but maybe CNAV and another person? Um, so, what do we mean by reagent characterization? Is it going to be just like conjugation based, or do we want to put anything else in there? That's yeah, yeah. I, I, um, yeah, and I, well, one, one of my thoughts when, is to combine renewable reagents and reagent conjugation slash characterization. Those are linked in my head enough that they could be one major section. And, and renewable reagents, we are referring to, you know, homemade antibodies like carbidomas and so on? Uh, right. Um, Yes, that, that, that are, yeah, and and that uh, so it'd be like one major section that was renewable reagents, Ananda Roy and re, and reagent conjugation, uh, CNM, uh, and character characterization is like actually measuring what these reagents are. Like directly. Um, that's why I threw in the word characterization. But um, do you just mean like loading antibody uh, dye or oligo loading on these? Or exactly. Validation. Exactly. Uh, well, so so uh, yes. I mean both. Well, the validation itself is pretty big. Topic on itself. Oh, sorry, I misspoke. Anoop, that's the fourth reagent validation is Anoop, and that's a separate pillar all by itself. I'm I'm sorry. Um, what I yeah, this, the character. You can do reagent sorry. reagent modification or modified reagent validation, like uh, modified oh. antibody. Yeah, from something uh, like that. Maybe. Much much better. Done deal. Modified reagents, conjugation, etc. Yes, applications. Okay, I think that that sounds um, yeah. more distinct. Yeah. Yeah, and reagent validation, Anup, uh, and sure. I'm I'm here to help. I'm here to help you on that, uh, Anup, too. Yeah. Definitely, we can use all the help. And if uh, Emma, if we can reach out to Emma, oh, that would be great, actually. Uh, actually, to have her on this paper would. 
Yeah, the, yeah. Ask. And so obviously you Stephen too. Yeah, and I you know I think there's enough energy to just keep up enough uh, energy to get to a goal line and you know so 2021 will there be a paper and you know uh, yeah uh, it, it, any other uh, aspects um, uh, yeah no okay I think we got it I got that those four sections uh, Ananda that was I think you got it. Um, unless someone can think of another leg or another pillar. Um, that is the recommendation of what we want to do. What what additional expertise do we need? Um, it's a good question. I mean, for example, for the modified reagents, I'll probably also include later on Peter Sorger, who is dealing with a lot of uh, fluorophore conjugated primaries, and then Gary Nolan's group, who are the other group doing uh, DNA conjugated activities as well, or anybody else is interested, but we can include those other groups, uh, I think, and write that part together. Yeah, and, um, we yeah. have done a lot of uh, dye conjugations, over 400 antibodies. So yeah, great. So we could also, I think, you utilize that. That'll be great. For sure, we'll bring in. I uh, just want to uh, reiterate that uh, you know the non-active participants or the passive observers are all free to join as they feel, uh, you know, in any of these legs. So are you volunteering something or Pothor? No, I just want to make a call out for everybody who's, well, you know, well, being shy enough not to speak up. Well, I hug you I'm already. Somebody from Ron Germain's group, one thing or another in this, is probably still working in the background. Yep, yeah, I'll put him in. I'll, someone from Ron Germain's group would be great. I think uh, Andrea has already volunteered. Yeah, she was awesome in the chat room, uh, Andrea. And she uh, just uh, posted a note. So, both Elizabeth okay, so and Andrea, was, they, 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 were, they could help you. Yeah, okay. And do you want to also, you know, potentially uh, extended to brain initiative as well since they have a very intensive activity effort too. Well, this goes across all consortia, I would think. Yeah, Quang, Quang Hoon, is there a, a specific person coordinating the antibody, the wild and wacky world of antibodies within brain? Uh, within our consortia? Yes, is, is there like a, because in HubMap there is a committee that's focused on it on a recurring basis. Oh, we, we don't have it yet. Okay. Uh, yeah, is there, can we, well here, I'll put you down as a uh, possible coordination point uh, and not, not committing you to help with this paper unless you want to. I would be happy to participate, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe I could put you down with the sub, uh, uh, the target selection bit. Would that be okay that you and I yeah. could? Uh, yeah, I, uh, you have I can. Good? Yeah, I can connect uh, this consortia with uh, Brain Initiative and uh, I can contribute to target selection for the brain, I guess. And in the chat box, we have uh, Jonathan Bock from Solving Technology 
if there is no conflict of interest, he said he could also provide help and advice. That might be interesting as well since they have their own commercial anti validation platforms and that might be an interesting thing to add as well. No, it would be good to have them because they have good antibodies. And they do intensive validation efforts, so I think that would be good. That might be an example for other companies who should actually support this effort more in the future. Yeah, and, also and so, okay, totally awesome. Uh, one other thing to consider might mentioned. be the... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one other to consider would be CP TAC because they're involved in validation as well, target selection and validation as well, and they've done some pretty rigorous stuff. Yep, and with Stephen... I, I uh, can function as a link to CP TAC, and I'll throw somebody else under the bus. Okay. Per perfect. Perfect. Uh, um, and I guess John Jonathan's a inactive uh, or observer is, but but oh well, we can cover it later. He wrote in the he wrote in the chat, so he he wrote a message in the chat. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, okay, as far as the last question, in, in the last 100 seconds, um, we, we've done great work. Uh, the last question is, you know, our next meeting is, and I hesitate to mention it, but what about ye old monthly teleconference? Um, is that where our next meeting could go or... Uh, maybe half hour to start with, just sort of check-ins and generate an outline. That might be the thing for the summer. You know, could we flesh out the, the meat, some of the meat on these bones, you know, sort of by the... I'm second that. Sounds like a good plan. Um, and do, do people, are people converging on Zoom? Or seems to be the best platform around so far. Okay, look at that. Andrea, you are all about it, Andrea. Look at her. Yes, let's just set a date and a Zoom link. Boom. <laughs> um, okay, that, that will be uh, on me. Uh, so, Neil, to set date and standing Zoom link. Uh, Okay. So wow. Congrats. That was a lot of progress. The 75 minutes to hear, by the way. I just want to invite people who want to test their um, Wi Fi to feel free to um, go to maps.com, just enter and as a seed test, and that might help you track down if you had a local issue or not. Um, if you had over 100 megabits per second um, and you still had sound, just let me know so that I can go and ding and try to figure out where the sound issues are coming from. So yeah, it's happening that. with your phone as well. It's happening from my end as well? Yes, yep. you just here. You're breaking up quite a bit. Yeah, oh, yep, yep, yep. Okay, well, well hey, no problem. Okay, enough. Second, so yep. is, is 100 megabits a second. What could go wrong? Right? Is that Kava speaking? <laughs> I'll, I'll put it in the yeah. chat. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Hey, enough purgatory for the morning. We'll have some lunch. Uh, we did it despite all the technical challenges. Thank you so very much. I will find you and we will uh, follow up. <laughs>